name is Julia Mejia, City Councilor at Large. I am the chair of the Boston City Council's Committee on Government Accountability and Transparency um, and Accessibility. In accordance with the Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, modifying certain requirements of the open meeting law and relieving public bodies of certain requirements, including the requirement that public bodies conduct its meetings in a public place that is open and physically accessible to the public. The City Council will be conducting this hearing virtually via Zoom, and it is also being recorded. This enables the City Council to carry out its responsibilities while ensuring public access to its deliberations through adequate means. The public may watch this hearing via live stream at www.gov slash city dash council dash TV and on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Files Channel 964. It'll also be rebroadcasted at a later date. Written um, comments may be sent to the committee's email at ccc.go at boston.gov, and it would be made part of the record and available to all city councilors. Testimonies have um, are and have not, um, if you want to sign up for public testimony and have not done so just yet, please email Shane Pack at shane.pack at boston.gov for the link, and your name will be added to the list. Spanish interpretation is available for today's hearing. And, and, and if this is accommodation that is needed, please email shane.pack at boston.gov for the Zoom link. Once you have entered the Zoom meeting, click the interpretation icon at the bottom, the right of the screen. Tenemos interpretación en español disponible. Si necesitan ese servicio, por favor, escribe un correo electrónico a shane.pack at boston.gov or a luz perez, a luz punto perez at boston.gov para que le enviemos el, el link, el enlace. Y ya una vez están en el Zoom, elige la opción de interpretación localizada en la parte derecha de la pantalla. Today's hearing is on docket 0520, an order for a hearing to audit how the Boston Police Department responds to Latino Spanish speaking res um, residents in the city of Boston. I am joined um, by my colleagues in the order of arrival. Myself, the chair, and also at large, Councilor President um, Ed Flynn, representing District 2, and my at large council colleague, Rutsi Louis Jed. Today's administration panel consists of Superintendent James Chin, Commander of the Bureau of Community Engagement, Director Stephanie Everett, Office of Pol uh, Police Accountability and Transparency, and Director Jennifer Villar Wong, Office of Language Access and Communications. I'm so excited because both um, Stephanie um, and Jennifer, uh, um, directors, worked um, closely over the years and so happy to see the office of OPAT um, fully operating and really um, grateful for your leadership as well as Jennifer for our work on our language access. So I'm so great that I have you both here to help us uh, navigate this and James, um, Superintendent Chen, who's always out in community. So really excited to have you all here. For our community panelists, we have um, Ine Lobo, who's the director of New Bay. We have Jacqueline um, Losao, who's, uh, who's a cashier at San Toga's Convenient and also a member of New Bay. We have Izzy Marano, who is the co-founder and past chair of Latino Law Enforcement Group of Boston. For the run of show, and because everybody knows I love to change things up, and because of this hearing is for us to learn and understand what Latino Spanish-speaking constituents have experienced with our new, with our law enforcement, I would like to start off, as you know, with leading with public testimony and listening to the voices of the people. As constituents, um, we really want you to share um, your public testimony to continue to inform our thinking. Um, and so if you have signed up and you're ready to go, we'd love to bring your voice in. Um, and if you're still interested in signing up, please do so. Um, then I will go into the community panel to share their experiences, and then we'll end with the administration. Um, does that sound about right? Everybody's good? Okay, great. Um, so this hearing order um, emerged from the countless complaints our office has been receiving from the Latino Spanish-speaking constituents. 
residents began reaching out to our office um, after the disappearance of Reina Morales. And since then, we have continued to hear from uh, more and more concerns. And as the only Latina representing the entire city of Boston and an at-large capacity, we wanted to make sure that um, our people understand that we see them and that we hear them and that we're here to respond to their needs. Ultimately, this hearing is dedicated to finding ways to work together and to come up with solutions. Um, I'm big on, we can have a conversation, but what's the sense of having a conversation if we're not leading into direct action? So I'm really looking forward um, to hearing your best ideas so that we can really think together what it is that this moment is calling for. Um, Latinos represent a big portion of our population. Since 1980, Latinos have led Boston's growth with 25, whoa, 256 um, thousand uh, percent of an increase in population, and now make up 20 percent of the cities. Um, and 43 of Latinos in Boston are foreign born, and 25 um, percent of Latinos have limited um, proficiency in English and identify another language other than English as their primary language. So the language is definitely an issue that we would like to touch on today, which is why we have also invited the Office of Language and Communication Access to join us. Earlier this year, my chief of staff, who resides in East Boston, assisted with the translation between a constituent and police officers. After asking several questions, the police officers admitted that they do not carry information in Spanish, although they have been asking for it for some, um, some, for some time. This is incredibly concerning, given that East Boston is composed of 52.9% Latinos. While the majority of Latinos are U.S. citizens, either by birth or naturalization, many remain um, intimately linked to immigration. And we know, based on research, that many immigrants, especially undocumented immigrants, are least likely to contact um, law enforcement due to the heightened fears around disclosure of their immigration status and police involvement in immigration enforcement. And unfortunately, we have heard that from many constituents that are afraid to contact the police. Although um, not a panacea, research shows that a key way of building community trust is by diversifying the police force, which is also improves public safety. The Boston Police Department has long failed to reflect the city's population. Nearly 65% of um, un, um, uniformed officers remain white, while other minority groups are underrepresented. 21.2 are black, 11.3 are Latinx, and only 2.6 are Asian. I hope we can find ways to incorporate more inclusive hiring and promotional practices in Boston's public safety agencies and build cultural and linguistic capacity to effectively serve Boston's diverse um, population through this hearing. And so I'm going to ask my um, colleagues for brief opening remarks. But before I do, I want to underscore the importance of what this moment is calling for, is for us to really think strategically and creatively outside the box. What can we do collectively, community, the administration, and the Boston Police Department, and those who are doing the work and living the realities to ensure that we're addressing um, the needs of our most um, resilient communities. So with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, um, Council President Flynn, you now have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for calling this important hearing. I'm honored to be here and also want to recognize Superintendent Chen that does tremendous work throughout the city along with Stephanie and, and Jennifer, who I've had an opportunity to work with over the last couple of years as well. Language and communication access is a critical part of city government, and it's a critical part of interacting with residents, especially in our public safety department, such as the Boston Police. I'm here to learn, and just want to say thank you to Council Mejia for bringing this forward, and um, hopefully I can learn as much as I can about the importance of language and communication access as it impacts public safety as it impacts the Boston Police and residents. Thank you, Council Mejia. Thank you, President Flynn. Um, Councilor Louise Jen, um, you now have the floor. Thank you, Councilor, and I wanna thank everyone um, for being here to be part of this discussion. Um, Latinos make up a, a significant part of the city of Boston and we need to 
make sure that folks feel comfortable to rely on city departments and city resources. Whenever there's an issue, um, we see this, you know, when uh, communities of color, when there are uh, people who go missing, uh, oftentimes uh, so there's, there's the reality and sometimes the perception of resources not going to making sure that they were, that they're um, properly returned home. And we know that if there's greater trust and greater community building, um, that would go a long way. Um, I think it's, um, there have been great strides being made with like language references to make sure that we are able to um, have a diverse um, uh, workforce, including in uh, public safety. So I, I, I want to thank and I know folks who are always engaged in community, Superintendent Chin, um, Director Everett for being here, and also Jennifer and the work that your team does at Language Access to really center communities that have been historically excluded because of their skin color and because of um, their language. And so um, I think everyone, all the members of the community who are uh, a part of this discussion, um, because I think there's, uh, I think that the folks who are in this room and even folks who are not in this room really do care about closing that gap and making sure that everyone feels like this is their city. And when they're going through a difficult time, there's a city resource, either BPD or another resource that is able to um, be, a, be a trusted partner. So thank you everyone for being here and I look forward to discussion. Thank you, Councilor Louise Jen. Um, in the spirit of how I like to do things is leading with community, because at the end of the day, we work for you. And um, would love to open it up for virtual public testimony. Um, and please raise your hand so that Ethan can allow you to testify. So if you have signed up for public testimony and you are here, um, please do so. Um, for the record, please state your name and an affiliation if applicable. Um, we have Marina Maldonado, Reina Reyes, and Francis Amadol, who are lined up to speak, I believe. Y por favor, um, la gente que están aquí listo para um, presentar su testimonio, si están listo, por favor, suban su mano para que puedan decir presente y comiencen con su um, testimonio. Marina. Hi, Councilor. I'm trying to bring her over right now. We, we have uh, Francis here, though, and okay. it looks like Reina is hasn't joined us yet. Okay, so let's go with um, Francia. Uh, okay. Gracias uh, por invitarnos a esta reunión que uh, muy importante uh, para la comunidad. Mi nombre es Francis Amador y soy pues he tenido el privilegio de vivir en East Boston por más de 28 años. Y una de las uh, cosas que me preocupa acerca de lo que está pasando en East Boston es que la policía no está atendiendo eh, la comunidad como debe de ser atendida. Um, yo estaba comentando que el 6 de julio mi abuelo de 83 años de edad sufrió un asalto en el cajero automático del Bank of America en la estación de Maverick, cerca de la estación de Maverick, um, no solo fue asaltado eh, adentro de la estación, también fue golpeado brutalmente. Eh, llamaron a la policía a la escena, la policía llegó, llamó al 911, a uh, la ambulancia. Uh, la policía le dijo, va y recoja el reporte policial de lo que pasó. Mi abuelo fue eh, a los días siguientes, recogió el reporte policial y preguntó a la policía cuáles eran los siguientes pasos. Y ellos le dijeron, bueno, no hay nada que hacer porque no tenemos, no tenemos quién fue, no sabemos quién, quién fue. Cuando, de verdad, hay, un, hay una cámara ahí en el Banco de América. Eh, usted lo que debe hacer es llamar al banco y que el banco siga su, su, su caso. Entonces, a mi abuelo lo hubieran podido haber matado en ese momento porque es un anciano de 83 años y la policía me hubiera respondido, bueno, no tenemos nada que hacer, llame al banco, que el banco tiene que hacer las investigaciones. Eso es, un, es, un, es una, preocup una preocupación para nosotros porque realmente nadie, no, hubo un, un, no hay un, un investigador en el caso, no hay nadie conectando, contactándose con el Banco de América más que nosotros como, ¿verdad? como víctimas. Entonces es algo preocupante, eh, ¿verdad?, que está pasando en la comunidad. Eh, también siento de que los casos que están pasando aquí, los asaltos, eh, abren los carros, uno va y reporta, eh, no, no están siendo investigados. No sé si es porque no quieren que East Boston se vea mal, 
por la gentrificación que está pasando, porque vemos de que se está moviendo gente diferente a nuestro barrio, ¿verdad? Y no quieren que el barrio sea desprestigiado con tanta delincuencia que existe. No sé si será eso el vehículo, ¿verdad? Eh, que está pasando aquí en Isposto. Eh, también años atrás yo sufrí una discriminación. Con, una vez fui, fui parada por un eh, policía y uh, yo estaba manejando, ¿no? Y fui, fui parada y él lo primero que me dijo fue, muéstrame tu registración y tu licencia, si es que tienes licencia. Solo porque soy una latina, me dice, si es que tienes licencia, ¿verdad? Entonces me sentí que, que wow, ¿cómo me puedes decir? Por, me, me hiciste un estereotipo solo porque soy latina. Y yo le contesté, sí, aquí está mi registración y aquí está mi licencia, porque ¿sabes qué? Sí tengo licencia. Entonces, estas son cosas a veces que nosotros como comunidad callamos, pero yo pienso que ya estamos como cansados, ¿verdad?, de estar callando. Yo creo que ya es el tiempo de escuchar una solución y de escuchar, eh, ver respuestas más que acciones. Y no es decir, oh, sí, necesitamos más policías. No, es necesitamos saber qué es lo que los policías que están actualmente trabajando están haciendo. Y, ¿verdad? y con eso ahí dejo mi testimonio y muchas gracias por haberme escuchado. Gracias, mi amor. I will do the, the interpretation consecutively right now. That's okay. Dale, no hay problema. Okay. For record, yeah. Um, thank you for inviting me. My name is Francis Amador. Um, I just want to talk about something very important. Um, here because i live in east boston i've been living there for eight years and uh, it's very concerning um, i have a lot of concerns about the police and how the police is not doing their job to serve the community um, in july 6th my grandfather who is 86 years old he was assaulted at the bank of america and the cashier at bank of america at the maverick station not only he was assaulted, he was beaten brutally. Um, then he went to the police station um, and the police said that they, uh, they, the police came and then the police told him, you have to go to the police station to get the police report. So then he went to the police station and then the police said that, oh, no, actually there was nothing they could do to help him. Um, and um, there was a camera at the Bank of American um, ATM so he should call the Bank of America to find out um, what happened. So the police was not, didn't do anything, didn't do its job, didn't assign somebody to investigate this assault. Instead, they sent him back to the bank and, and tell the bank to, um, to investigate this. So we have been victims in the community and uh, uh, as I mentioned, um, not only he was assaulted, in other cases would be um, cars, that a lot of cars are being breaked into. And uh, perhaps people are not saying this because it might look bad, because a lot of gentrification is happening. Perhaps they don't want to say that these things um, are happening. And another incident I had with the police is years ago, I was stopped, I was pulled over by the police. And then the first thing they asked me, you have your registration and a driver's license if you have one. And uh, you know how I felt like they were already stereotyping me as a Latina. Um, so I show my uh, registration and I said, yes, I do have a license. Here is my lens, my license. So a lot of things have happened and we've remained quiet, but we are done, we're tired. And that's why we're here. We want more. Um, actions. We want more solutions um, from what the police can do right now. So, if si puedo preguntar que abren así en, en como porciones para la próxima persona, that would be great. All set. Sí, gracias, gracias. Así lo seremos, lo, lo haremos. Y disculpe. Eh, ahora vamos a seguir con Marina Maldonado. Creo que ya está aquí y vamos a hacer la interpretación en pedacitos. Eso quiere decir, deja que la intérprete eh, le ayude para que no tenga que recordarse todo en, en una sola eh, hablada. So, Marina. Sí, me están escuchando. Mi amor. 
Ok. Uh, buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Marina Maldonado. Vivo en el Boston, en la Ivo. Uh, vivo ya por 20 años. Y una de las cosas que han pasado, una de tantas cosas que hemos estado viviendo últimamente, eh, nosotros tenemos una distribución todos los sábados de comida y a esto conocimos a nuestra vecina Claudia. Ella tenía en ese momento que pasó este problema de dos semanas. Permiso. De haber... Disculpe, disculpe, Marina, no se le escucha bien. Lo siento. Sí, mi amor, Marina, él tiene una conexión que está un poco floja. So, si puede buscar otra locación para poder oírla claramente, porque es muy importante que podamos oír um, su testimonio. Hoy sí me escucha. Ahora sí, mi amor. Vamos a ver, sigue. Dale de nuevo. A ver. Sí. Uh, sí, eh, mi nombre es Marina Maldonado. Vivo en Ipo, 20 años, en la Ipo, Y tenemos una distribución de comida todos los años. No, mi amor. Esto, conocemos mi amor. a nuestra vecina Claudia. Mar Marina, disculpe que... Afortunadamente no se oye muy bien. Yo pienso que si usted puede llamar. No sé qué está pasando, si es el... And while we wait, I also want to um, note for the record that we have been joined by um, uh, District 5. Uh, Thank you, Reina, y después sigo yo. Sí, mi amor, vamos a seguir con Reina, después regresamos contigo, ¿ok, mi amor? Um, We're going to go to um, Reina Reyes. Eh, por favor, um, comience con por ahora para ver si la podemos ir sin ningún problema y no se olvide que le dé un chancecito para que la intérprete pueda um, darle seguimiento a su testimonio. OK, um, Reina. Hi, Councilor. She hasn't joined us yet. Oh, she hasn't joined us yet. OK. Bueno, well, Marina, mira a ver si te puede conseguir otro lugar. Y um, lo que le voy a hacer es que para seguir dándole seguimiento al, a la audiencia, yo voy a seguir ahora con la, la panelista de la comunidad. Marina, después te traigo para atrás de nuevo, ¿ok? Yo creo que, I believe Reina might be in the um, waiting room. Can you just check to see if she might, might be there by mistake? Y si Reina, si tú estás aquí, sube la mano para que te vean y te entren para, para, para donde estamos toditos aquí unidos. Ok. Lo que voy a hacer que voy a seguir ahora con, um, I'm, I forget that I am hosting this, um, and it's in English, I'm speaking Spanish the whole entire time. I'm, gonna, I'm going to transition now to the community panel, and we're going to give uh, Marina an opportunity to find another space to Um, join us. We are still waiting for Reina. Um, and, um, and we'll see what happens. So I'm going to go to the community panelists and we're going to start with um, Envy, any, uh, any, Lobo. Um, ¿Habla en español o en inglés, mi amor? Sí, no, en español. ¿Podría ir Jackie primero para llevar la consecuencia después de ella? ¿Estaría bien? Claro. Muchas okay. gracias. Siempre, mi amor. Um, voy a comenzar ahora con Jackie. Eh, Jackie, uh, usted tiene cinco minutos y tiene, el, como quien dice, el piso. Ok. Uh, buenas tardes a todos. Uh, mi nombre es Jacqueline Lazo y vivo, soy residente de aquí de Boston desde hace 20 años y soy su vecina aquí de la Benito. The translator, de, pues, yes. si quieres seguir con eso. Okay. okay. Hi, my name is Jackie Lazo and I'm a resident here for 20 years and I'm your neighbor. Gracias, primeramente, a, la, a nuestra concejal, Julia Mejía, por tomar el liderazgo en esta audiencia tan importante para la comunidad. Como ustedes saben, en East Boston hemos sufrido muchos asaltos, violencias, desapariciones en los últimos, en los últimos meses. First of all, thank you to um, City Council, um, Julia Mejía, por her leadership. And, um, 
just be leading this here and today for the community of East Boston because we have been uh, experiencing um, violence, disappearance, assault in the um, past months. Yo trabajo en una tienda aquí en East Boston y hace, eh, bueno, en diciembre, para ser exacta, un tipo entró a la tienda, me asaltó, llamé a la policía, ellos llegaron inmediatamente, yo lo llamé, um, pero la sorpresa mía fue que a los dos meses, o menos de los dos meses, yo lo vi al tipo rondeando la tienda y aún todavía él rondea la tienda donde yo trabajo y ahora soy yo la que lo veo y me corro, me escondo, tengo miedo porque tengo tres niños. Pareciera que fuera yo la que lo, lo he atacado a él. Um, so I work at a store in East Boston. Oh, there was an incident that happened in December. There was a uh, men that enter the store and jumped on me or assaulted me and uh, I called the police. The police arrived. But then, um, to my surprise, two months after that, this man kept coming back and walk around the store where I work. And then I have to run away from him. I have to hide from him because I have three children. And it seems like I'm the one who um, who committed this um, this incident against him. Y mi pregunta aquí es que yo quiero pues entender a uh, cuáles son los procedimientos que la policía en sí lleva, porque lo que tengo entendido es de que ellos trabajan con la corte y lo judicial, ¿verdad? Porque yo trabajo con muchas organizaciones, con algunas organizaciones aquí en East Boston y también soy colaboradora de las escuelas públicas de, también de aquí de East Boston. Y eh, tengo muchos padres, muchas familias de aquí de East Boston que acuden y, y platican a veces casos que le pasan a ellos y tienen miedo a acudir, llamar a la policía. Son crímenes que se quedan con, en el limbo. Y así eso lo que hace es fomentar más violencia. And my question is, I would like to understand what is the process uh, that one has to follow with the police? Because um, if, if it's aligned with the court, if uh, there's a judicial system, how does that work? Um, because I work with some organizations here in East Boston and also um, volunteer with some of the Boston uh, public schools in East Boston. And when I see some parents um, that join some of the meetings, they share different cases and they're afraid. They're afraid to um, do something about it. And that's how this, um, this crimes um, stay in limbo. And um, that, that's been a lot of um, violence being committed um, lately. Continue. Porque lo que estamos ahora aquí es como para buscar pues soluciones uh, para, para mejorar nuestra comunidad. Porque eh, pues quiero vivir y sentirme en una comunidad, eh, vivir en una ciudad segura, eh, que pueda caminar tranquilamente. Eh, pues como le dije, tengo tres niños menores de edad y tengo que pues salir con ellos. Um, so that's why I'm here. I am here to find solutions, to see how we can make improvements, improvements in our community. I would like to uh, live in a community where I can feel safe, uh, where I can just walk, take a walk um, peacefully without, um, as I mentioned before, I have three kids that are minor and I would like to just uh, go out for a walk with them. Eso es todo, Jackie. ¿O quiere algo decir algo más, mi amor? Sí, también, eh, porque uno se siente, um, se siente con aquello de que, por ejemplo, tenemos el caso de nuestra compatriota Reina Morales. O sea, ¿qué se supo de ese caso? ¿A dónde quedó? La, la comunidad pregunta qué pasó con esa señora que han dicho la policía. Ellos se refieren a la policía, pero 
en sí no sé quién es que lleva el, estos procedimientos y todos los hemos quedado así, qué pasó con ella, cómo siguió el proceso, o sea, yo pienso en ella porque ella es, es madre, yo soy madre, eh, deja a sus hijos, tiene su, sus familiares, ¿verdad? Erika. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> um, so do you have anything else to say? Yes. Um, so I feel like, you know, my, my uh, fellow country person, Reina Morales, um, uh, I'm wondering, or people are wondering, what happened to her? And people are asking what happened, meaning asking the police, like, what, what have they done? What process have they followed? Um, and I want to find out more about her because she is also a mother like me. And um, like a mother, she left kids behind, she left family behind. Gracias, Jackie. Si no tiene más nada que decir. No? Sí, eso es todo. Ay, gracias, Jackie. De verdad, estoy bien agradecida por tu voz. Um, just saying thank you, Jackie. Thank you for your um, your voice and, and bringing us um, your lived experience. Thank you. Any, te lo doy para ti ahora. Tienes cinco minutos, ¿ok, jefa? <laughs> Muchas gracias. Eh, buenas tardes a todos los concejales, concejales que están eh, conectados y comunidad en general. Gracias, concejal Julia Mejía, por tomar el liderazgo en este tema tan importante para la comunidad. Mi nombre es Jenny Lobo y vivo en East Boston por más de 12 años. Y um, soy vecina de la Bennington también, pero también soy la coordinadora de la organización NUBE, que es Neighbor United for a Better East Boston. Y hemos estado haciendo bastante presión con la comunidad por este tema, precisamente de la, desde lo de Reina Morales, Hace poco le fuimos a dejar una carta, creo que a todos los concejales. Eh, todavía no, hemos, no fuimos a la policía porque está hasta en Dorchester, nos dijeron en la oficina central, pero es una idea que queremos uh, ir a dejarla porque están más de 150 personas. Ok, eh, Deja, eh, eh, un Ahí. Momentico, tenemos que hacer... Espérate, mi hija. <risa> Erika, tiene que tener mi testimonio, ella lo puede decir al final de todo, si quiere. Erika, ¿quiere...? ¿Quieres um, comenzar o quieres hacerlo al, al final? ¿Cómo lo quieres hacer hoy? Lo sigo si no cambias mucho. <risa> no, no voy a cambiar mucho. Okay. Pero puedes hacerlo consecutivo si quieres. Ok, voy a hacer lo que dijiste. Uh, so, thank you so much, um, everyone. Thank you also, um, Tricosol Mejia, for uh, your leadership um, for this uh, important topic for us. And uh, my name is... Any and uh, I'm a coordinator with the uh, Neighbor United for a Better East Boston, and um, also I'm a, a neighbor uh, on top of that. So this topic is very important. We've been putting a lot of pressure towards the case of um, Reina. And uh, as a matter of fact, we deliver a letter to each city council member about this, and we were planning to go to the police headquarters which um, is, in, is in Dorchester. Um, y la, la última cosa que dijo, 150, ¿qué? Uh, firma de votantes que, firmó, que firmaron la carta que están preocupados por la seguridad pública. So they, we, we have 150 signatures um, that signed that letters where folks are concerned about safety. Continue. Como saben, East Boston es una comunidad con más del 50% de latinos, comunidad de habla español, con hijos en las escuelas públicas de Boston, con educación básica. Nuestra comunidad es una clase trabajadora, honesta, que salimos adelante y tratamos de no depender del gobierno o del Estado. Eh, excepto que sea maybe necesario o urgente, pagamos igualmente taxes como todo ciudadano. Um, so East Boston is a community with more than 50% of um, Latinx who speak Spanish. 
with kids in the Boston public schools with um, basic education. And East Boston is a working class community. Uh, we're honest people who want to uh, get, improve ourselves. And we try not to depend on the government or the state, except if it is in urgent need. And we also pay taxes as any citizen. Como parte de una organización que trabaja con las comunidades más marginadas y criminalizadas por un sistema que muchas veces no trabaja para las grandes mayorías, que ahora somos nosotros. Antes nos llamaban las minorías, pero yo diría que somos las mayorías, eh, sino para las minorías. Hemos trabajado este tema desde el 2014, donde tenemos testimonios reales donde las mujeres eran eh, y siguen siendo brutalmente abusadas y violadas. Se han presentado los casos y hasta el día de hoy seguimos en el mismo sistema. No han sido resueltos la mayoría, como es el caso de Reina Morales, que ya comentó mi colega Jacqueline Lazo. ¿Dónde está Reina? Entendemos que el tema es de seguridad y confidencialidad por parte de la policía, pero también por lo menos deberían de dar un indicio de que sí están haciendo algo, que sí siguen en la búsqueda de Reina Morales para saber realmente qué es lo que pasó con ella. Y ella es un referente de muchas mujeres desaparecidas. Entonces, me gustaría saber qué están haciendo por ella. Um, as part of um, an organization that works for the community, the marginalized community, or the community has been criminalized by the system, um, and the system does not work for the so-called minority, uh, even though we are a majority now. Uh, we have been uh, working on this topic since 2014, where we have real testimonies of women who were brutally abused and they were raped. And these cases, um, they just being swept under, under the rug. Um, and there's no um, outcomes for these um, cases. And just like the case of Reina Morales, that my colleague Jacqueline Lasso mentioned, where is Reina? Um, we understand that there is some um, confidentiality and safe um, barriers that the, the police uses. But at least they should give us um, an idea of what's happening. Where is she? Um, yeah, where is Reina? What's happening now? He, he conocido muchísimos casos por más de una década y estamos aquí siempre en lo mismo. Como organización creemos que la solución no son más policías. La policía hoy por hoy, después de las escuelas públicas de Boston, es el que más presupuesto tiene de la ciudad. Eh, ¿Por qué ustedes tienen el mayor presupuesto de la ciudad? Porque hace una semana fuimos a protestar en frente de una casa de un dueño que es abusivo, maltratador, injusto, que está atentando contra la dignidad de una ciudadana en East Boston. Cuando el dueño llamó a la policía, inmediatamente, en menos de tres minutos, llegaron más de diez eh, patrullas y, si no me equivoco, dos carros de detectives. Pero cuando una persona de color llama a una persona particular, siempre no tenemos policías, no hablan español, no hay suficientes eh, policías, etc. Creemos que eso no es la solución, como mencionó eh, Frances Amador también en este testimonio. Erika. So, um, I have known a lot of cases for, um, for over a decade, and we're here again and again to talk about the same thing. As an organization, we believe that the solution is not to have more police. Because um, after the Boston uh, Public School, the police has a bigger budget in the whole city. And we all know that um, because um, a few weeks ago, we went to protest in front of a house of uh, an abusive 
um, homeowner who was mistreating folks, um, and it was unjust that this is happening, and this is a, an, an attack against the dignity of uh, citizens of East Boston. So when we went to the protest in front of that um, landlord's house, the landlord called the police, and in less than three minutes, three, 10 cruisers were there, and, and if I'm not mistaken, two uh, detective cars were also there. But when a particular um, person or a person of color called the police, what they say is, um, we don't have officers who speak Spanish or we don't have enough police officers. And like my um, Francis Amador also mentioned that more police is not the solution. Toda la seguridad en East Boston ahora mismo no está siendo reportada o denunciada públicamente. Eh, todo es porque está claramente conectado con los incrementos de la vivienda y, el, y la gentrificación. Si esto se sabe, todos los nuevos edificios no se rentarían y tampoco se venderían. Por lo que nos gustaría escuchar de ustedes cuáles son las propuestas que tienen para trabajar juntos con la comunidad, una comunidad marginada que no habla el idioma. Eh, y nos gustaría saber si ustedes tienen eh, algunos tipos de entrenamiento que podrían dar a la comunidad para comenzar a, a tener una relación mejor. Ustedes nos entiendan y nosotros entender los procesos de ustedes. Um, so the whole insecurity in East Boston is not being uh, reported or people are not reporting this publicly. Uh, because it seems that it's very clear that it's connected with the increase of gentrification. If, um, see if we see this with all of these new buildings that are coming here, um, then if we would talk about these things, then those uh, apartments wouldn't be um, renting them um, and much less to sell them if they talk about um, violence. That's why we would like to hear from you. What um, proposals do you have to work together um, to work with the marginalized community who does not um, speak English? And we would like to uh, create a relationship and work with you so you can understand us and we can understand you. Entender también que ustedes no son nuestros enemigos y nosotros no somos sus enemigos tampoco. Queremos crear una comunidad más abundante donde podamos interactuar en, entre todos. También que, seamos, que sean más responsables a todas las culturas. No solamente somos los hispanos, los blancos, sino hay que ver unas culturas más marginadas que esas, ¿verdad? Los asiáticos, los musulmanes, que de verdad de ellos casi nunca se habla. And, um... We want you to know that you're not our enemies and that we want to work together in this abundant um, community. And also that how can we more, be more responsible to all, to all the cultures, not just the Spanish speaking folks or white people, but other cultures like Asians, Muslims, that um, are the community that, that's been more um, affected. Nos gustaría que hubiesen más policías de habla hispana que entiendan la cultura de nosotros, pero también eh, otros idiomas, ¿verdad? Porque solo el inglés y el español no es lo que existe en la realidad. Pero eh, también quizás el sistema de justicia, porque la policía es una cosa, imagino que el sistema de justicia, los jueces y todo son otra parte diferente que también a veces afecta a la hora de que ustedes hacen el trabajo. Also, we would like to have more um, Spanish speaking officers and other cultures as well, not just um, because we don't only speak English or Spanish. Um, and also we would like to um, follow up and understand how the criminal justice work um, and how the judges and, and all the process. And, and I know that it affects to their job. Y tenemos una petición para todos los concejales 
eh, si nos pueden dar el edificio de la ex policía, que sea un edificio comunitario donde podamos crear de verdad una comunidad eh, más abundante. Um, so we want to plead and ask every single member of the chamber if they can donate or give us the former police station so we can use it in the community and we, we can create a more abundant community. Y lo último que yo tengo una pregunta como, eh, como representante quizás de una comunidad atrás que tenemos como organización. ¿Es realmente legal que los, oh, bueno, eso va a hablar Marina, pero eh, quería preguntar en cuestiones de migración, si es legal que un policía llegue y le pida un documento, eh, le pide el pasaporte a la persona que quiere arrestar o que con la que está hablando, si le pide el pasaporte o su, o su documentación, si es algo legal que lo deben hacer. Muchas gracias. Gracias. And lastly, I have a question um, as a representative of an organization of the community, and I know that Marina will talk more about this. Um, if, is it legal to ask immigration documents? Uh, for example, if police, um, is it legal for, for police or local police to ask for a passport when they arrest someone or ask for those kind of um, papers? Is it legal? Thank you. Gracias, um, gracias. Um, no solamente por eh, seguir peleando y luchando para nuestra gente, pero para siempre haciéndonos responsables y trabajando con nosotros, dando en cuenta que toditos trabajamos juntos y es la única manera que vamos a seguir adelante. I was just basically um, just thinking any for her um, testimony and really just uplifting the importance of us all working together across all of our differences here, because at the end of the day, if we can if we can get to a point when we're not doing this and pointing fingers and that we're really bringing our best thinking into these sort of spaces um that is how people are going to feel heard um and it's also an opportunity for us to listen to see what the administration has been doing what are some of the guardrails and some things that we may not even know about as community um so these, these are the spaces that i think really offer us an opportunity to really unpack the work that the administration has also been doing so i'm hoping that we we can do that um and i want to just note for the record that we have also been joined by district one my council colleague Councilor Corletta, who represents east boston the north end and charlestown um who has also joined us a while ago and sorry that i um in between uh, making sure that people were speaking, I, I forgot to mention you, but I wanted to just note for the record that you have been here. Councilor Coletta, do you want to say a few remarks before we move on? I'm so sorry. Hi, everybody. I'm so sorry. I was trying to find the mute button. Um, thank you so much, Councillor Mejia, for, for recognizing me. And, and thank you to my my neighbors and community members who have gotten on, taken time out of their busy schedules to talk about their experiences and uh, talk about um, their vision for um, a truly welcoming community and trying to find solutions to, to work with our local police officers. I would love to understand from everybody you know, how we can build trust, because it sounds like there's still a lot of trust building that needs to happen. And I am willing to lean in with my council colleague, Mejia, and, and her leadership has brought us all together and uh, tried to, like you said, bring our, our best thinking to the table. So I'd love to hear from community members how we can build trust. Is it regular uh, convenings like this? Should we have more, obviously I heard that we need to have more officers who speak Spanish. Um, but I would love to hear hear from them. Um, and then I would love to hear from uh, Superintendent Chin, who is here, and thank you so much for being here, as well as um, Stephanie, congratulations. We're gonna miss you, but uh, um, thankful for your work in the OPAD office. So, and thank you for the space, Councilor. Thank you, Councilor Coletta. I am really looking forward to what happens when we bring our best selves into these spaces. So really excited. Um, and yes, shout out to Stephanie. I didn't know it was gonna be appropriate, but I just wanna give you a shout out. You're moving up and on. Yes. Um, 
um, and it's sad to see you go, um, but I'm so incredibly grateful for your leadership. You know, uh, I worked alongside Councillor uh, Campbell and Councillor Arroyo in establishing OPAD, and you have just brought it to a whole nother level and created so much more than what we had initially anticipated. So really are grateful for your leadership and everything you've been able to do since the establishment of this um, department. Um, but before we get to the administration, and I know you guys have been so incredibly patient, um, I have always said that it's important to lead with community and those are who are living the realities and doing the work. Um, so we have, par we have partnered up with Diego, um, who, uh, who we, ha um, the president is not here, but they sent their, um, the co-founder um, and I'm one of the, uh, the originals here to be with us to help us really understand as we're start, as we are thinking about, when I think about language and I think about um, the importance of having representation, for me, it's not just language and interpretation, but it's also about cultural identity and being a native of, 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 of whatever culture we are uplifting. So we're talking about specifically the Latinx community, um, and this is an organization that has been deeply rooted in making sure that we're uplifting Latino law enforcement. So I'm really excited to have Izzy here, who's gonna help us understand um, kind of just what's at play and the ways that we can um, bring some real solutions to this conversation. So Izzy, thank you for your leadership and you now have the floor. Thank you, uh, Councilor Mejia. Thank you for everybody for allowing me the opportunity today. Uh, I am representing Today, I am speaking on behalf of the current chair, uh, David Hernandez, of the Latino Law Enforcement Group of Boston, uh, affectionately known as Jego Boston. Uh, we formed in 2017 as a social group uh, uh, and comprises of, of uh, police officers, mostly Boston, but uh, various law enforcement officers who oftentimes realize that in the work that we do, we were forced to choose between the police culture and the Latino culture. We needed to identify with one or the other. There was no room for, for both to be recognized. Um, and so we wanted it to be deliberate in how we did that. Uh, we formed in 2017, and then we realized that it, we needed to do more than just form a social group, right? Uh, there were certain discrepancies that we identified within the police department as well as across the city um, in regards to Latino representation. We met with uh, the current mayor, Walsh, uh, at the time uh, and spoke to him. Uh, and our approach is unlike other organizations uh, or community groups and stuff like that, where there's kind of like, we're pointing fingers um, and it's easy to point fingers about where, where, where the discrepancies are. Um, that's something that, you know, the community already does. Um, so as an organization, uh, we would figure out like, what can we do? We sat with Mayor Walsh and we talked about the lack of Latino representation within BPD, right? Since that was something that we were intimately aware of. Um, at the time, the Latino community was over 20% in the city of Boston. Uh, if you started to include the undocumented, that number actually increases. Um, yet the Latino representation within BPD was less than 9%. Uh, and if you start looking at other city agencies uh, within Boston, that number maintained its low percentage. Um, so then we asked ourselves, so how are we properly providing services for that community? Um, and, you know, we had a very frank and candid conversation with the mayor uh, and pointed to recruitment, right? Um, not many Latinos are taking this test. Not many Latinos are getting hired. And then those Latinos that are getting hired aren't graduating the police academy. Uh, and so we put our heads together. Uh, Jago Boston's like, how can we contribute to that? How can we change that? Because if we don't do anything about it, the city can continue to say, well, if no one's applying, then we can't hire them. So we put together what's called the pre-academy training. Uh, we put together civil service prep courses that are free of charge. So anybody interested in taking a civil service exam can sign up on Jiggle Boston, look at the dates that we're offering this, these prep courses so that they have a better chance at scoring at the exam. Mind you, understand that the exam is written at a college reading level, yet all that's required to take the test is a high school diploma. So 
those communities that don't have access to quality education are already behind the eight ball in regards to this exam. So we're trying to kind of remove that uh, for those individuals that only have a high school diploma and help them get a better score for a better opportunity. But just getting a better score wasn't enough. We decided to put the pre-academy training. It's a 10 week program on Saturdays when we run it, because we don't run it all the time, typically around a police academy when it's about to come up, where we give people a glimpse of what an academy is gonna be like. Physical fitness, we basics of constitutional law, criminal law, things of that nature. We also touch upon the history of policing in America uh, and having an understanding of that. While we're a Latino organization per se, we're very all-inclusive. Uh, more than 50% of our graduates have been women, which is another underrepresented uh, demographic within the law enforcement community. Um, so we've been very deliberate. Um, if, if, and, and I welcome counselors to come down and, and, and check us out during the next class. We're very diverse, a lot of women, uh, not just Latinos, we have white folks, we have Asian folks uh, and African-American folks. Um, and not just for Boston, this is for anybody pursuing a career in any law enforcement field to include Suffolk County sheriffs, state police, which we've been successful. Um, I think, I, I don't, you know, I, I'll leave this out because I don't know the exact number, but um, two of the black females within the state police came through our program. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, there's only 10 across the state, which is, you know, quite disgusting. Um, but nonetheless, I'll leave that out. Um, so we took that on. Those are the, those are, those of us talking about solutions, right? And we've been doing this on our own, right? No support from the city, no support financially from any organization. We do our own fundraising and all the officers that are contributing to this program, all on volunteer basis or the individuals, not because not everybody just police officers. We have a lot of civilians also contributing. Uh, Greg Henning, uh, former candidate for a DA, a volunteer as a time and teacher's constitutional law, as well as financial literacy, which is another area where our community uh, is lacking. Uh, excuse me as I look at my notes, because I want to make sure I don't, I don't leave anything. This conversation is really about equity. It's not about special treatment for a community. It's about equity. This is what the foundations of our forefathers talked about this country, equity. You know, and at the time that that conversation of equity was really specific to a specific group, you know, particular group, but now we realize that this has to be all encompassing. In order for this country to continue to move forward and progress and continue to be great again, uh, it's about equity for everybody. Uh, and so that's what this conversation is. And so we talk about, we're talking about Latinos right now, but we also can't uh, overlook the Cape Verdean community, the Haitian community, uh, the, the Asian community, who make up a good portion of Boston and they have these substantial pockets in the city of Boston, yet we don't have enough representation, not just in the police department, but city agencies across the board to include our schools. How are our students supposed to get any better, right? And get a quality education if we don't have these language speakers, right? If we don't have the accommodations so that they have a fair chance, we can't talk about equity if it's not being equitable. Um, so, so those are the things that we as Jigo Boston are trying to address in at least our field, in our world. Um, solution, recruitment. We have to be better as a city in recruiting. We have to advertise, we have to market, right? Um, and then retention. We've lost several offices these last few years to retirement, but also to other police agencies in other parts of the state, um, as well as um, firefighter. In our own city of Boston, we've lost close to 100 offices over the last few years to Boston Fire. Um, a lot of that has to do with the climate, right? Uh, within the community, the climate uh, on policing, uh, the, 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 the climate of defunding and things of that nature. And I think that if we all decided to actually sit around and just point out all the actual things that needed addressing and had a conversation in the dialogue, we might be better off at retention and better off at recruitment. Our black and brown folks aren't taking these exams because it's not one, an attractive job. It doesn't seem attainable. And at a time where it's not very popular, the reality is, is that there's still a need for law enforcement. I'd love to live in a utopian world where there isn't a need for law enforcement, right? Just like we'd love to live in a world where we don't need firefighters because fires won't exist 
in in burning people's houses down and all that, only in cooking. Like we can't assume that everything's going to stay in a pocket. So we have to understand that we can't eliminate certain services because it fits our emotion, right, at the time, or it fits a trend or an event that took place in another part of the country. Now, with that said, Jago Boston's always been open to conversations and we've led conversations in regards to police reform. So we're talking about organizations, talking about police reform, never been opposed to police reform, pro-police reform, because we understand that while these things happen in other parts of the country, we're one event away from it happening in our own. So how do we have rational, reasonable conversations to where we have effective uh, uh, policies put in place to make sure that we aren't the next uh, Milwaukee, we're not the next New York City. All these towns, Milwaukee, New Orleans, uh, Baltimore, Seattle, all similar cities as far as demographics, size of the city and population, yet their crime rates are through the roof. So, through the roof. so seriously, understand that we're doing something different. And I think it has something to do with organizations like Jago Boston and other organizations are doing the work, MAMLEO, the CBPA, the Asian J Society, all these organizations, at least in law enforcement, are doing that work. Um, when we talk about retention, we also got to consider opportunities, um, opportunities for growth, for promotion. Uh, in any field in the world, in any profession, there has to be an opportunity for growth if you want folks to continue to buy in and put their best foot forward. We're not really seeing that historically. Maybe now it has been a little bit better, but historically it hasn't been that case. Uh, with the last promotional exam, they were right down to a score group where you had 50 candidates to get promoted to sergeant uh, of, 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 the, of minorities, right? Whether they were females or people of color, and they were the openings within the police department yet the city failed to promote them. Uh, and so when we talk about, oh, we want to promote more so that there's more representation in the ranks so that you can go to lieutenant and captain and better represent the community, well, that's not happening if we're overlooking those opportunities and not taking advantage of those opportunities. And understand that when we're talking about language speakers and we're talking about right now today, the, the topic again is, is Latinos, or Spanish speakers, we also got to understand that folks that speak a language Right, regardless of who they are or what their background is, because they speak a language, they have a better understanding of culture. Right, so someone who, uh, I have a friend who is Jewish, went to Venezuela to study, speaks the language fluently, and has an understanding of the culture. And because he has an understanding of culture, it makes him a better police officer when dealing with certain demographics of the community. He understands the holidays. The cultures are celebrating the first years of birth, um, baptismals, things of that nature, right? So when you involve yourself in learning a language, you also involve yourself in learning about that culture, and that brings about education and awareness. So we need to continue to encourage those things and encourage that, you know, um, encourage folks within the community to really, you want to see change? Then let's be part of the change. And that change has to start from within. Run for office apply for those jobs, take the civil service exam for fire, for police, apply for Suffolk County, whatever it is, we want to see change. We have to continue to find ways to encourage our folks to take these exams, to put in those applications, to seek the quality education, take advantage of these programs. We're not really advertising all that stuff. We're keeping it a secret and we're only telling our friends or our families or our next door neighbor. And it has to be a way where we can just blast it all out so that our friends and families and the people that look like us can have that equitable access to those opportunities. I end with that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Izzy. Really do appreciate um, all the gems that you have shared with us. And I think what is the most important thing to underscore is that we are in a climate and we are looking at what's happening across the country and there is a sense of hostility. And I think that oftentimes we feed into it, but we have such an amazing opportunity in this moment to seize it and to really look at and look to each other, not against one another, to really think about how we're going to get to where we need to be. I always talk about the fact that I have an award-winning personality and I have yet to utilize it in a way um, because I came into the council fighting. But what really um, inspires me is when I'm able to bring people together across their differences. And I think that this particular situation that we are talking about here today 
presents itself with the opportunity for us to both look at the administration, the community, and those who are doing the work and or living the realities to really see ourselves in these, in these conversations as agents of the change that we want to see. And I think that if we can model this behavior and we can, you know, sometimes put our own ideological differences to the side and look at what is this moment calling for and what's it going to take for our communities to feel safe, to be seen, to be, to feel like they're being treated with dignity. Um, this is what it, this is what it looks like. And I'm really excited and encouraged that we are all here having the same conversation because that's not the norm. So I think this is just the beginning of what is possible in the city of Boston. And I'm happy to be a part of it and, and really grateful for everyone who has brought themselves into the space. Um, I hear that, um, I believe, um, Mar um, I, Marina, I believe que ya arreglaste tu situación y va a poder compartir con nosotros. Marina? Okay. Um, Okay, voy a seguir. I am going to, I know that um, my colleagues, um, I believe my, the, as always, and I'm going to give President Flynn the best attendance award because not only does he show up, he stays through the end and I really do appreciate how you model behavior, um, President Flynn. Before I move on to the administration, I do wanna ask if you want to ask any of our community panelists uh, any questions at this point before we move on to the administration panel. Okay. All right, so I am going to uh, move on. Um, and, and really do appreciate everyone's patience. Um, I'm gonna start off with our um, administration panel and I'm gonna go straight um, to our dear friend, Superintendent Chin. And I don't want my community panel to go away because I do have questions for everyone. So um, Superintendent Chin, uh, you now have five minutes and the floor. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. Thank you, uh, the other city councilors on the call and the community for coming out to bring some of these topics up, especially uh, to the city administration. Uh, my name is Superintendent James Chen. I am the chief of the Bureau of Community Engagement for the Boston Police Department. You know, I welcome the opportunity to testify at this hearing today to share with the council and the community how the Boston Police Department is working to build trust and provide public safety in all of our communities, including the Latino community. The Boston Police Department is committed to providing services and enforcing laws in a professional, non-discriminatory, fair, and equitable manner without consideration of specified characteristics such as race, ethnicity, immigra immigration status, or proficiency with English. There are many efforts, uh, policies, programs, and resources in place to ensure that we are appropriately and proactively responding to the residents of the Boston to address concerns and solve problems and to keep our community safe. Uh, some examples are working with the Office of Language and Communication Access on our departmental LCA plan. Uh, we also translate uh, vital documents and training the staff in all different languages, ensuring that interpretation is available for BPD interactions with the community members uh, via a bilingual officer or employee or by accessing uh, language lines. Uh, new diversity recruitment officer working with Yego and other groups on targeted outreach for police recruits and cadets. Uh, we have a civil rights unit, family justice division, and homicide unit connecting victims and survivors with services and supports um, and bringing offenders to justice. Uh, we also recently revised the missing children and persons rule and revised the missing persons form to now track ethnicity in addition to race. Um, so just real quick, I, I heard some uh, questions and, you know, I want to address that right now we do have a recruit class uh, currently in the academy uh, with uh, 79 of 150 recruits. Uh, are bilingual and most of them speak Spanish. Uh, 13 of them are trilingual. 
um, and two, speak at least four different languages. And the Boston Police Department, we're committed to um, protecting all our communities from harm and hatred. And we understand that many immigrant communities bring with them bad experiences with corrupt or militarized law enforcement from their home countries. The Bureau of Community Engagement, the Civil Rights Unit, and our 11 district community service offices, we also do outreach to these communities through events, activities, programs, and community meetings. Uh, what's important that we have to understand here is that education and awareness is very critical. Um, we run discussions and dialogues so residents will know their rights, how to report a crime or file a complaint, and how to contact us with quality of life concerns and any other issues. We want residents to be empowered to advocate for themselves and their communities. Um, myself, I've been at uh, attending Lead Boston, um, you know, Immigrants Lead Boston, uh, we Are Boston, the event. I spoke to a lot of uh, the Hispanic community of East Boston. And what I did say is that, you know, invite us, invite us into your community. And so we can tell you about the police department and maybe answer some of these questions that linger unanswered, right? Um, you know, we have a very active role uh, in connecting with especially our immigrant communities. Uh, most of our officers, a lot of our officers are uh, children of immigrants like myself, and we speak different languages. And, you know, a lot of it is just perception that we don't understand the immigrant community. You know, I, for one, I have, uh, like you heard from Officer Marrero, uh, obviously we are bilingual and we have parents that speak the language and they have come from other countries and we understand the challenges of all these immigrant communities. And we also want to share with those communities what we believe um, is the solutions that we come up with that may be, okay, I'm from another country, I understand that there are challenges here, but I'm gonna work with the police department because they are not the same police department that I may have come from. We have ways that we do things here that are open and transparent, and I think we just need an opportunity to come into your community to speak to you and to offer any answers to some of these questions that you know, um, that you have. So I welcome that. I think I went over five minutes, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay, don't worry. Um, you are here to be fully expressed. Um, and everyone, with, everyone just for the record has gone a little bit over. Um, it's the summertime, so I'm giving a little bit of grace. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna move on. Thank you so much, Superintendent Chen, for your um, remarks. And I really do appreciate you grounding us in the reality that you too are an immigrant. You know, I mean, your you come, you, your family is um, from a, another country, and you've learned how to speak a different language, and you have navigated this world, and you understand the complexities of what we're discussing here today. So, so thank you for bringing yourself and your full self into this conversation. So I'm gonna go next to um, our colleague. Director Everett um, to uh, share some remarks with us as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Mejia, for um, arranging today's hearing and for our community partners for sharing your thoughts and expectations of us um, as um, representations of you as a department head. Um, I definitely understand what the responsibilities are of this organization. So the Office of Police Accountability and Transparency um, I serve as the executive director. Um, I will say OPAT just for short because his name's too long. Um, I just, our charge is to receive, investigate complaints of misconduct of um, personnel, both sworn and civilian of Boston Police Departments, but also look at policy that um, is the rules and procedures of Boston Police Departments. So as mentioned by um, my good friend, Jimmy Chen, we work together on the missing persons policy along with Jen's office to update it um, recently. Um, so one of the things in the time that I've been here, I'm the, the first ED of this office, it's been here um, for a little over two years. Um, and I, I do wanna say this, that even though this office is new, this office has been actually asked for for 30 plus years. So um, one of the 
paramounts of asking for this office and fighting so hard as Council Mejia was talking about doing with her colleagues a few years ago was that this office was asked for 30 plus years ago, not just um, in the wake of George Floyd. And I've had the honor of leading this office since um, and carrying the weight of this office. And so the, the words that I heard today from our community partners are words that are echoed in the reports that I read when I first got in here. Um, Sadly, words that were shared with those who wrote reports from 1992 um, and continued on asking for things that were happening that are similar to things that have happened um, since social media has taken force. Um, there were things that happened in Boston Police Department that makes it harder for the community today to trust. Um, and we've been working alongside community partners and with Boston Police Department to build trust that has not existed here. And I, I do believe that we all, in the sentiments that the council keeps saying, we do have to figure out how we're going to give each other that grace to stop building um, in that space. Because there is a long history in the city of Boston of not having trust, um, not just with community toward the police, but police toward the community. And in order to get there, I believe that one of the main charges that the um, Office of Police Accountability and Transparency has is to um, serve as a conduit to figure out how do we start doing that. And the ways that we have been doing that um, is not only just looking at the complaints, but being very intentional that while the marches are ended, that our feet are still moving. Um, and knowing that there's been individual harms done in our communities that resulted in losses to our families because our families wrap themselves around our individuals as they are trying to help them get through things. Um, and that has a huge impact on our communities because our communities are losing both individuals and families as that happens. And so we just have to figure out how do we move forward together. And so that's the work we've been doing here. Um, and we've done that intentionally. We know that in order for the police to have a recruit class like they have right now, it will require community members to apply to work, not just as police officers, but internally inside of BPD, whether it's in the policy arena, clerk, or being an attorney, I'm always gonna push people to be attorneys. Um, there's a lot of jobs within there. So working with um, the equity and inclusion cabinet, working with Boston Police Department, we partnered um, together and was working with um, Conan, Harris and Associates and Strategy Matters through um, collective efforts to try to look at what they need inside of BPD to increase their retention, their promotion, and their um, hiring efforts. And we'll continue to do that work in FY24. We started in FY23 um, and being very intentional of what that looks like because we do need a police force that is reflective of the community that they serve. We also know that the policies need to be updated. Some of their policies are from 1985. Um, and that's why we were looking at some of the, the missing persons policy. Um, and the Boston Police Department and the Chief Commissioner Cox is not unaware of that. There are some intentional work and efforts that have been done there. But again, we have centuries of mistrust um, that we are working toward in decades of policies and procedures that need to be updated. That work is going on. Um, on our dashboards, you will see the work that we do. Um, we try to be intentional. The OPAC commission meets quarterly. We do pull that information out. We do pull that work out into the community. So I, I do ask that you pay attention to what OPAC is doing because we do pull BPD in. We just had the meet, get to know Commissioner Cox last month. So there, there's a lot of work that we are trying to do so that your voices are heard. So we do encourage you to still come in. We're, we're not saying that we got this figured out at all. Um, we still need your voices. Um, and for the residents of East Boston, I do have two of your residents working in my office. Um, my um, executive assistant is, lives in East Boston um, and my investigator is one of my investigators from East Boston. So um, very intentional about having um, East Boston in my office, but also um, language in my office. And those two women definitely keep me very informed about what's going on in East Boston. So I thank you again for having this counselor and for the community partners for being present today.
Thank you, Director Everett. And um, again, I'm really excited to see you moving. Um, it's gonna be a loss for the city, but it's great for the um, county. So really excited about your leadership um, and really do appreciate everything that you have done for OPAD. And, and I think you've done more, that, as I mentioned earlier, than what we had expected. So thank you. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Director Wong um, for you to go next, and um, and then I have some questions. And this is this is a real a dialogue between everyone, right? Because I think it's important. Normally, the way we do hearings is just a Q and A, and um, the counselors ask questions, and you all answer. And I really think that you. I think that when we do things differently, we ex we get different results, and I would really love an opportunity for us to have a dialogue with each other. So, hoping that you all will um, join me in that. So, I'm going to go next to you, um, Director um, Wong, for your um, comments, testimony. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. Um, uh, when I started this, good afternoon. Um, so my name is Jennifer and I am the director for the Office of Language and Communications and Access. Thank you for um, all the counselors who um, gave me the opportunity to come and testify at this hearing alongside my city colleagues. And thank you to the community um, and members who also spoke um, and shared some powerful stories. Um, a little bit about our office. Our office is has a privilege to work alongside um, the entire city in ensuring that anyone in the city of Boston, regardless of language and disability, are able to access services um, and are able to participate fully in um, government and boards and commissions and so forth, um, ensure that they have access to the information that they need in languages that they um, speak and prefer. Um, I wanted to take some time to quickly highlight um, some of the work that we've been doing alongside the Boston Police, um, as well as many departments in regarding to um, language access, disability access, um, as Superintendent Chen um, did mention, we are working with them to uh, and other departments on creating departmental language access plans. And what these documents are, are um, documents that outline how a department's program services and information will be accessible to constituents. These will be uh, posted publicly. They will be in uh, plain language uh, and translated in the city's top 11, 11 languages uh, for citywide. Um, they will also house information on a department's most vital information and vital documents, which will also be translated in the city's 11 languages. We also had the privilege to work alongside um, the Boston Police um, in ensuring that staff across the department were being trained on our policies, not only in relation to acquiring interpretation over the phone, but also acquiring interpretation via a video remote interpretation service, which allows for an interpreter to come up on a screen uh, through a webcam and enabled device. Um, and we are creating uh, e-learning training for the academy, as well as um, being brought in to train in person uh, the recruits. Um, in addition to that, there's reoccurring trainings that we as an office do for the entire city that cover um, everything from creating uh, accessible events to ensuring that folks know how to use our um, on-demand interpretation services. Um, and other more um, complex meetings that we're having with BPD as well as with other departments is taking a look at all the services and programs and activities that departments do and sitting down and analyzing um, how we integrate the standards that the city has around language access and ensuring that from the beginning to the end of all these program services and activities, they are accessible. And um, before ending my remarks, I want to take a minute to say thank you um, to the folks on my team and BPD for their work. I'm just humbly able to represent them here today. Uh, so I wanted to say thank you to Felita Milome, Robbie Adams, Lawrence Glenn, and thank you to Sergeant Detective John Doyle and Jennifer Maganochi, who meet with us on a biweekly basis for this work and advancing that. And of course, um, thank you to um, uh, Stephanie Everett, who we work very closely with, and uh, Superintendent Chen and uh, BP. Um, and I'm excited for questions. Thank you, Councilor Mahan. 
Thank you, Jennifer. I'm really excited to uh, dive in and really do appreciate your leadership, um, especially when we work together on um, the 2.0 version of the language access and making sure that we have um, interpretation in all 11 um, languages that uh, represent the city of Boston. So thank you for your leadership in that space and for working in partnership with our office um, and making that happen. Uh, so would love to um, just give us a moment to really think about kind of what we've heard um, both from community and the administration and some and the folks who are doing this work. Um, and this is the opportunity for us to think about what can we do, all of us, right, um, to really close the, the communication gap, the cultural gap, um, to make sure that Latinos in particular, um, Spanish speaking residents, not just in the city of Boston, but uh, I mean, in East Boston, but all across the city of Boston, um, really feel supported. Um, and so I'd love to just start off with some questions. And I'm not sure who from the administration may be able to answer this, but I'm just curious about, um, in terms of the demographics, I, I see speaking a language very different than just um, being a native speaker and a, someone who has the native, uh, the cultural understanding of, a, of, a, of, a, of an experience. And I'm just curious, um, are officers who speak an, uh, another language, are they paid at, at a different rate? Superintendent Chen, do you know? Uh, no, no, they don't get a special language rate, no. But you, uh, they, I mean, what's that? Know, I'm just curious, um, because they are asked to do more when they are in the translation type of environment. And I'm just curious if, if you think that if by you know how they do the different scales, you know, so if you um, if you speak a, a, a different language or more, I think more importantly to me, are you a native speaker and you are a, a, someone who can fluently um, speak in more than one language, is you saying that there is no special pay, uh, pay rate for that? No, there's no uh, special pay rate. Um, I think one of our challenges too is that, you know, uh, when we're hiring officers, you know, we have to hire through the civil service. And um, in the past, we we have asked uh, for a list for uh, a certified language preference list. Um, and, you know, we've, we've been able to get some uh, language other than English, right, officers to come on the job because of that. But however, uh, recent requests, uh, they have not, uh, you know, Civil Service Commission has not granted us that language preference list. So I guess two parts of that question is that, yeah, we don't get paid extra for it. And, um, you know, we just run some challenges of hiring because of that. Okay. So what would you say is a path forward to help address that issue? Well, I mean, we have things that are in place, like uh, we have our cadet program, which is another uh, avenue to get, um, more diversity on the department. On top of that, you know, these are um, these are youth uh, adults that have grown up in the city between the ages of 18 and 25 to come on the cadet program. Once they complete two years on the cadet program, they get preference on the list, um, and then they get hired by the police department after they take the civil service exam. So, Izzy, I'm just curious because of a lot of the work that you guys have been doing. Uh, and I know that Diego does a lot. Diego does a lot of around programming, and so I'm just curious from a policy standpoint, um, any recommendations that you can have to increase um, the Latino law enforcement and also um, making sure that we are meeting the moment for Spanish speakers. Uh, yeah. So you know, it's just again, it's 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 a recruitment effort, right? Uh, uh, Superintendent stepped talk about the cadet program. Uh, which is a phenomenal program. Full disclosure, that's how I got on through that cadet program uh, over 20 something years ago. It's, it's, it's gotta be the intentionality of hiring the diversity in these cadet programs. The cadet program intention, uh, when it was initially uh, presented, my understanding is this is a way of circumventing somewhat the civil service process so that individuals that can't get over, get that high score, because. You may not realize this, but 20 years ago, when people, when the civil service exam came about, which was every two years, 
um, there'd be over 3,000 applicants from the city of Boston. So it was very competitive to get on. So the cadet program was a way for the individuals that didn't necessarily have access to quality education that necessarily didn't score high enough to get in. So um, it was an opportunity to circumvent the civil service process to continue to uh, hire diversity. Now, somewhere along the line, that got lost in translation. And if we go back to making sure intentionality is hiring uh, uh, members of the communities of, of color um, to include or be intentional with language speakers, uh, then I think that we can put a, a big dent on that need. I, I'm curious before we move on to um, a member of the administration or some of the community members, um, if there's, if, and I always like to give this as, a, as an example of like, if there's one flaw um, that can be fixed and it's an easy fix, um, what's something that we could do right now that you think is that, that we haven't done or have considered doing? Any recommendations that we can, like an easy fix right now? I mean, Supreme Court's knocking it down. Bring back mm -hmm. affirmative action. The consent decree. Uh, when the consent decree was in place, uh, you saw an increase in diversity. Since the consent decree, you saw, according to the numbers, a drastic decrease in, uh, in members of the communities of color being hired. So, um, yeah, but the one, one, one thing is, let's get back to, to reaching out to the communities. Let's get the information out. There's a lot of information out there we got to let them know. We don't advertise a civil service exam. People, all of a sudden, it just comes up. Oh, I didn't know it was coming up because we do a poor job, right? We keep these secrets to ourselves. So we, as a department, put together through the Bureau of Community Engagement, right, who already has the relationships with the members of the community. They're already doing the work to be able to say, look, here's a marketing program for the civil service exam coming up. Hey, you want to do this job? Right, and then you're having people that look like them. If you look at the members, of, if you look at the Bureau of Community Engagement, it is the most diverse bureau in the police department. And they're the ones tasked to establish these relationships with members of the community. Let's put together some sort of marketing program to do exactly that. I hope the administration is taking notes here of what we need to do differently, y'all. Because um, budget season is going to be around the corner next uh, year, and we need to start thinking about these sort of conversations because we can't keep having the same conversation and expecting different results if we're not really asking different com different questions. So I really do appreciate that answer. I'm curious from you know uh, any of the directors here, as you continue to navigate um, these conversations, anything that you'd like to offer um, for consideration um, that you have not been able to do just yet, but in an ideal world, um, if we can tweak things here and there, whether it be a protocol, a procedure, or even a policy, what would that look like for you? So we, we are doing some of this work. So um, again, we had an FY23 budget. We did get money for um, a consultant to look at the BIPOC hiring, retention, and promotion within BPD. And then we got an additional $10,000 this fiscal year. So in looking at um, that work and everything that Izzy just said, Izzy, I believe, spoke to the consultants about that. Um, we agree. I believe that we need to be creative. I always say my office is the work of creation of someone being very creative and saying that we that the time is now, let's just do it. That's how I feel. We can wrap the world around twice with all the studies that people have done saying why we need to do something when we can just go ahead and do it. Um, so for recruitment, we have a new director of recruitment, Susie Helmy. Um, and so we need to utilize her a lot more. Um, I've talked to her. Um, she was actually part of the internal group with BPD, the um, equity inclusion cabinet um, in our office when we put together the RFP for the consultant um, and when we do the check-ins. So that everyone, before she moved over to BPD. So she's very intimately aware of the need to increase diversity within BPD. Um, there is a stigma about being a police officer right now. And I do believe that we can break that. I talk to everyone and I, everyone I could talk to and I always say, you can't come to me and say there's an issue, but you're not willing to help the issue by going in. If you have the means to go in, go in. 
because then you can help fix something, right? Um, so I do believe that we need to be creative about how we market BPD, law enforcement careers, period. Um, and having those conversations early on, that's why we have a youth advisory council, is why we are hiring for a youth coordinator now, is how do we encourage We've had Jimmy come into the office. You come in already yet, Jimmy? We have everyone come in and we have them talk to our youth and we encourage these conversations. Um, I know people look at the Office of Police Accountability and Transparency as like you're anti something. We're not anti, we are collectively trying to figure this, this work out together. And the way that we do this is through communication. I mean, it has to, a lot of intentionality. So I think that what we need to do is one, be creative in how we the same marketing where there is um, any job fairs, making sure that we are, as a community saying, is BPD gonna be there? Cause we know they have jobs, right? And so asking BPD to be at that table, we as a community should start asking BPD to be there and stop waiting for people to go there. There's also, we have to be honest that a lot of us don't believe that we have jobs opportunities available to us for city of Boston, whether it's on the administrative side or in BPD. And we have to have these conversations with ourselves and with our family and tell them to look on these websites and apply, but also find out different places where we can post these jobs or go to RCC, go out to Bunker Hill, go to these different places where we don't traditionally show up and encourage people to apply and let them know why they should be there. So we have collectively a lot of work to do. And um, I, I believe, I know we can do it. We just have to put on our creative hats and start moving in that direction together. Well, I, I really do appreciate that. I guess, you know, one of the questions that were posed by one of our community members, um, I mean, any, it was you, um, and si todavía está aquí, me gustaría que, um, que tuviera aquí, porque voy a hacer la pregunta para ti. Um, she had asked in regards to uh, the protocol around asking the, where police officers ask people for their passports or immigration papers if they're interacting with them. And, you know, we worked with community to try to have a better understanding of the different things that were at play. So I'm wondering if anyone here on the administration can just talk to me about um, and share, share with the public really kind of what is the norm around asking um, someone um, during a, a regular stop for their immigration papers. Is that the norm or is that something that can get reported? And if, and if it's been reported, kind of what, how do you follow up on a, on a situation like that? So maybe um, I can speak on that. Um, so the Boston Police Department, you know, we're committed to ensuring the safety of all people, regardless of immigration status. Um, there is what is called the Trust Act, and it was a city uh, ordinance that was created to clarify that Boston police officers are prohibited from acting as federal immigration officers or sharing information with United States Immigration and Customs Enforcement uh, for civil immigration or enforcement purposes. Uh, the takeaway from that is that, you know, we never ask for your immigration status. There's no bearing on you reporting a crime or us uh, investigating a crime, right? Um, you know, uh, we cannot arrest or detain you only for immigration enforcement reasons. We uh, do not share your personal information with ICE, including your name, your social security number, physical uh, description and address. Uh, we, we don't transfer you to ICE uh, custody. And, you know, I think there's just this stigmatization that we're like part of immigration, which we're not. We're here to protect you as a person, regardless of uh, you know, race, color, immigration status. We never ask for any of those things. We just ask what happened and you tell us and then we investigate. I mean, I can't put it as uh, simple as that, you know. Um, so I think a lot of this, you know, a lot of people don't understand that, you know, we ask, maybe maybe there was an ask for a passport only for identification purpose, you know what I mean? Like a license, we ask for a license or, you know, we're there like, okay, do you have any ID on you? Maybe they, thought that, okay, asking for a passport was inappropriate or whatever it was. But, um, you know, no, we don't ask about immigration status, you know. Uh, thank you for that. And I'm just curious, Director Everett, um, when, if and when these situations do happen where um, an officer, maybe they didn't know, maybe they unintentionally did it, but intention versus impact, sometimes it lands for people 
they, they probably didn't give them the full scope that they were just asking for a passport because the individual probably didn't have a license. But let's just say that it was the case in which the way we just heard it right now and that the person felt intimidated or whatever the case is and that the passport was asked for. What, what are the proper protocols in place for someone to be able to report something like this? And what would your office do as a result of it? Um, so there's two things that can happen. Um, so you can file a complaint with the Boston Police Department's Internal Affairs Division, or you can file a complaint with our office. Um, either will do. Um, if you come to us, we have developed a new program, the Community um, Mediator Program. So we have a community mediator. In the instance that was just explained by um, Jimmy, this is where the trust building begins. If this is an officer who is giving out information and he's uh, or she or they are really just, I'm trying to help you by identifying different ways for you to identify yourself. Um, and we need this officer to learn what, how your questions and your terms and your usage is harmful to our community and why it's harmful. Um, this is where the mediator comes in at because you need to sit in a room and you need to hear how it's harmful and let this the mediator the, to the complainant and the mediator and the um, community member need to have this conversation. Um, that does not result in a complaint for the officer. It does result in the officer learning culture awareness from the community member, which uh, we believe is really an impactful way to build the trust and also have the officer learn something that they're not going to learn in the academy, and that is their community that they're serving in that culture. Um, if But the parties have to agree to that. The other thing is that if they wanted to go through with an investigation or go through the complaint, we would just go through with the complaint um, and determine the rules and procedures that were violated. And um, it, an investigation would happen and then it would go through the civilian review board for their review um, and determination. And then their recommendation would be presented to the commissioner, similar to what I, the internal affairs at BPD and the commissioner on both sides is the final determination of any discipline that could amount, um, come to go to the officer. Thank you, thank you for that. And, and I know um, Annie has to leave at four, but um, she had mentioned in her um, remarks about the importance of really building that it's not us versus them, is that you know if we could all work together. And Annie, I'm really curious if you could share with us um, how do we deal with the tension that exists between community and police officers? And what would you say are some of your um, recommendations so that we can start building that trust um, and really start getting to where we need to be? So, any, a mí me gustaría que si tú, bueno, Erika, yo te voy a dejar que tú hagas tu trabajo. I'm not going to be translating for you. Dale. Eh, gracias. Eh, Eni, entonces le está haciendo la pregunta de cómo crear confianza. Creo que tú dijiste hace ratos de que no, no somos enemigos, sino cómo podemos empezar a crear esa confianza y trabajar juntos, ¿verdad? Entonces, si usted pudiera eh, contestar a la pregunta de la concejal. Eni, esa pregunta es para ti, mi amor. Estás en silencio. Eh? O Jackie, o cualquiera de las personas que todavía tengo de la comunidad, a mí me gustaría saber cuáles son sus ideas para poder desarrollar una relación más fuerte con la policía, porque sabemos que en la comunidad ahora no nos sentimos bien seguros. Alguna vez nos sentimos que hay como esta tensión. So me gustaría saber del público qué es lo que nosotros podemos hacer diferente para comenzar a desarrollar esa relación. Sí, ya. bueno, sí. Bueno, gracias. En mi caso, sí. Um... Eh, me gustaría sí que la policía tuviera esa relación con la comunidad para que tuvieran la confianza eh, en exponerles sus problemas, ¿cierto? Para lo que ellos necesitan, pero 
que la, la policía hace reuniones comunitarias? Esa es mi pregunta para el oficial. Si las hacen, yo tengo 20 años, nunca he escuchado de una. ¿Dónde lo publican? ¿Dónde lo hacen? ¿Lo pasan por las redes sociales? ¿O dónde invitan a la comunidad a asistir como barbacoas? Cosas así donde puedan relacionarse con la comunidad. I don't know if the initial question was directed at me, whatever. I just kind of, um, my phone kind of froze for a quick second. Um, Excuse me, I need to interpret this. Thank you. Um, okay. So thank you. And in my case, the police uh, needs to have a relationship with the community so the community can start trusting um, them and present their problems, their needs. Um, so my question is, um, is if the police department has done community events, because I've never been to any of them, if they've done it, how do they advertise it? Is it social media or where do they advertise it? Have they attended any barbecues to build relationships? What's that? So every uh, district in the city has a community service office. And if it's a community event that's going on in those districts, they usually reach out to all the community groups that they're involved with to uh, advertise and let them know that there are things that are going on. You know, we are working on a new website that will uh, list um, events that are going on in every different part of the community throughout the city. So that's coming soon. Um, and yeah, I think that's how we do it now. I mean, I, I'm in charge of the Bureau of Community Engagement, so we intentionally reach out to different parts of the city to make sure that everybody's inclusive. So when we put on like National Night Out that's coming up on uh, July 31st and the 1st, there's a, there's a citywide event. It runs from 3 to 9 p.m. We're going to be stopping in different parts of the city um, and basically celebrating all the different communities. So like things like that, those are big events, but there are smaller events that happen within the district that the community service offices actually uh, put out and work with the community to put out. So like, please reach out to your district community service office if you plan to have some kind of community event or if you're interested in, in knowing about community events and they'll provide you with that information. Izzy, I see that your camera's on and because you guys have done so much work in community, I'm curious if you want to offer um, anything around some of the programming um, or opportunities that you uh, can share with folks here. So yeah, I mean, social media is really, really what we're using uh, to advertise. And so it's about identifying those organizations, right? Um, and then subscribing to that. Boston Police has BPD News, right? Subscribe to that so that you'll get that sent in an email or via text message. Um, the City of Boston, Office of Neighborhood Services, I'm sure they have some of those things. Because um, there's like a coffee with a cop or the mayor's going out, you know, coffee in the neighborhood and things like that. So there's there's individual things. And like, like uh, Superintendent Chen spoke about, uh, every district has a community service office. And sometimes it does take our own initiative to find that out, right? If we want to start making a change in our neighborhood, then all right, let's go down there. There's a community. Now that we know there's a community service office, let's reach out and say, hey, how can I be more involved? How can I be better informed? Uh, but as far as thinking outside the box, um, something that I sit on other boards, um, I sit on the governor's hate crime task force. I was on the body worn camera task force as well. Uh, I'm on the board of trustees at RCC. And one of the things that we've done at all of those boards is host listening sessions, right? Host listening sessions, whether we do it virtually or whether we do it in person, uh, to give members of the community an opportunity to come out and speak their mind and say what they'd love to see, how they'd like to see it, um, and to talk about their personal experiences. Uh, another way would be to host uh, community dialogues. And I believe the commissioner is currently doing something like that, like an informal version of Comstat, where he's inviting members of the community in. Uh, and that's huge, right? Because that's that's starts establishing 
that level of trust is like, look, this is what we're doing. We're not behind closed doors having these conversations. We're including the community. But if we can do that more on a street level, um, dialogues, meeting folks where they're at, and we start having these difficult conversations, right? Because let's be real, the conversations are going to be difficult for both sides. Um, and if we come to have these difficult conversations with the intent of understanding each other and then healing, right? Because a lot of healing has to happen. Um, then I, 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 I'll see, I, I believe that once we start doing that, you'll start seeing a shift in, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the climate involving policing and involving the community, right? Uh, like, uh, like Stephanie had mentioned, there's a distrust of the law enforcement right, from the community, but there's also distrust of the community from law enforcement. And so we're not talking to each other. So if we start establishing um, some sort of dialogue to where we have these opportunities, now people have these opportunities to say their piece, we might see a shift in that. So that's just something else that I don't know if uh, the city wants to uh, initiate. I know I do, I'm raising my hand. I'm always here for it. Um... Right. And I, this is why I wanted to have this conversation specifically um, in bringing Spanish speaking uh, and Latinos into this conversation, because oftentimes we do create space, but it's not in the language or in, you know, you have interpretation if you're lucky. But I think having a conversation in your native language with officers that also speak that language and understand that culture could be really powerful. I'm Superintendent Chin, and I think that as and I think it's an invitation that I'm hearing from community that if there is a desire, I would love to be able to help support something like that where we're bringing um, Spanish speaking officers and Spanish speaking communities together so that we can begin to have that relationship building, you know, as so many of us have identified here is the trust and it has been fractured. Um, and it's also looking at the political climate um, around immigration, like across the country people are feeling under attack. And I think if there's something that we can do here in the city of Boston to help bring people together, right? In ways that feel safe um, and that we can be vulnerable. I, I think that that is kind of the direction that I'd love for us to lean into because having been in office now for three and a half years, I've learned a lot of what happens and what doesn't happen, right? And I think that when you are at your best, when you're able to bring opposing views together. And I think that that's what this opportunity presents itself. And I and I would love to be able to utilize some of my social capital, you know, on my platform to, to bring this conversation uh, together. So I'm just raising my hand here and volunteering my time and my staff um, to work alongside the administration, you Superintendent Chin, Izzy, and some of the communities um, members that are here today to really have a restorative justice dialogue that begins and ends with, I see you, I see you, like I really see you. And I think that that is not something that we have done um, within this particular community. And I would love to be able to just kind of offer that as a very specific, tangible thing. Because again, I don't like to have a hearing for the sake of having a hearing. And accountability is really important because we get things on the record. But if we're not really moving forward, in ways that people feel like it's going to move the needle, then it's just a waste of everybody's time and energy. And I really want people to feel like we're walking out of here with some very specific things that we could potentially do. So I wanna offer that as, as a tangible outcome of this conversation and would love to invite Jennifer in your department to be a part of that. Um, Office of Neighborhood Services, Izzy had already mentioned a few, um, but I think doing so, Superintendent Chin in the native language of, of the Latino community. And I think that's a, a blueprint that you can use in other communities. Do that in Haitian Creole, do that in Cape Verde, you know, do that in, across all the top 11 languages, because then and only then are people who are not English speakers can see themselves truly heard and reflected. So I, I do believe um, Jen and your team and, and, and the administration um, that there should be some resources allocated to doing something like that. And I'd love to be a partner with you all in, in doing that. So that's an invitation. Gladly accepted, Councillor. But um, just to let you know, we, we do do that often. We do have um, uh, officers who speak a different language uh, participate in dialogues. Even like myself, I've gone out to 
do active recruitment in the Asian community because I, you know, I speak another language. But once um, we have these dialogues with the community and they understand that they look past the uniform, okay, uh, we, we find out we have so many commonalities, right? Like I was born and raised in the city. I went to Boston Public Schools. I'm a child of immigrant parents. Like these resonate loudly amongst the immigrant population, right? So I believe that once they understand that we have these commonalities, they look past the uniform, right? And they, didn't, they see a person and they say, well, you know what, this is, this is somebody that I can actually uh, relate to, right? So it's this barriers that we, I call them imaginary barriers, right? Because they are, because once you start talking about it, we're all the same, right? We, we all have, you know, similar backgrounds. We all have similar challenges, uh, but it begins with a conversation and to kind of like, you know, put your guard down for a minute and let me talk to you. Let me explain who I am. Let me explain how we're the same in certain things. And maybe we are different. And let me learn about your culture, things like that. So these are these are things that we need to enhance with with the community. Right. Like, I think a lot of this stuff is just perception. And, you know, as and it was just like I've attended many events where after I spoke, you can see that that elephant in the room is gone. Now they're willing to talk. Now they're willing to open up now. But it starts with a conversation. So um, I think that that's very important. And what you're saying is uh, what we'll, we'll definitely do. I mean, you invite us, we'll come. I'll bring Spanish speaking officers. I'll, speak, I'll bring whoever you need to kind of break those barriers. Because that's what we're about, you know. Um, so with that, okay. that's about to you. So I, I appreciate that. And I also just want to note that, you know, the reason why we uh, filed this hearing order was because of the Reina Morales situation. But even before that, when I used to do organizing with parents, there was another issue that trust was broken. Um, there was a young man that was deported um, from East Boston, and that was just another situation. And I think that any who um, testified and she testified in 2014 around some of these issues. So 10 years later, you know, we it's not something that has gone away. It is a persistent conversation. And I think what the community really wants, and I'm so glad that OPAD exists because it gives us an opportunity and a vehicle to really look at some of the things that have been systemic, right? It gives us an opportunity to identify those things that we can do differently moving forward. And I think that the Latino and the Spanish speaking community in particular are really looking um, to feel like a sense of resolve. Um, some of the things that we heard the community mention here is that when it's issues of other community, you know, the the example that you heard about the uh, the landlord, they, they were there in three minutes, but when it came to, you know, regular residents, uh, the response rate is not as quick. So there is a perception, and some of it is. Some of it is because it is what it is, but I just think that it's important for people to know that they are valued and that they are respected and regarded. And I think that that is part of the trust building, right? And I just want to name that as something that we heard and that it's important for us to reiterate because the community brought us here to this point. And those are some of the things that were brought up. And I'm just curious, Superintendent Chen, if you could just talk to me a little bit about some of the discrepancies that some of the members of the community shared about the response or lack thereof for them. Uh, so I, I don't know in particular about that type of incident, but you know, when officers receive a radio call, they're going to respond the same way regardless. And you know, we. We don't know what the race is, right? We don't know what the ethnic background is. We're responding to a 911 call. So I can't see how they could have determined whether even that was even a factor, right? So, but, you know, rest assured that if there's something that doesn't seem right, um, like uh, Director ever said, you can file a complaint and we'll investigate it to see if there was any um, truth to that or whatever it is. And believe me, we, we do policing bias free. You know, and that's that's what people have to understand. Like, you know, maybe it took a little bit longer to respond to a call that particular day when that other call came in, and maybe you know, like, but we can't determine, you know, which call is different than another, right? And you know, like I explained at one of these uh, community meetings that you know sometimes uh, they they wonder why it took longer to respond to their radio call or whatever it was that 911 call, so. We run priority. We prioritize our calling. 
So it depends on the time of day, the volume of calls that are coming in and the number of units that are available. Sometimes it may take longer to respond, but if it's something, an act of violence, we're gonna try to get there as soon as we can, right? Like within minutes, because we're gonna pull somebody off a less priority call to come and respond to that. So, um, you know, I don't know if that offers any explanation. Uh, I don't know that particular instance she's speaking about, but you know, we, we do try to respond to every call the same way. And we pri prioritize priority one calls. It's like someone's getting assaulted. Priority nine is probably like a loud party, right? Not, not as important, but still we're gonna get to it if we can get to it. Depending on time of day, number of units available, you know, all those, those are all factors. So um, I don't know if that offers an explanation for that, but. It does. It, it, you, you have managed to put some things in perspective in regards to you don't know who's on the other side of that phone call, right? So it's easy for us to assume those things. Um, and so I, I do appreciate your, you breaking it down for us. So thank you for that. I'm just curious. I, I wanted to make sure that we are super um, mindful of everybody's time and want to be respectful of just making sure that community, if there are any other questions um, or, or things that we have not addressed here that you really want to make sure that we uplift. Um, this is from the community panel and also the administration that this is your space, right? I just happen to be the chair of this hearing, but at the end of the day, um, we're all here bringing our best selves into the to our hearings. So just wanted to make sure that everyone has had an equal opportunity to um, share some things that they want to make sure get noted for the record, any resolutions or ideas or solutions that you want to bring or any commitments. This is your space that includes Izzy and some of the community members and also the administration. So with that, I'm going to put myself on pause and get, there we go. Izzy got the camera off. So that's a cue that you ready to go. So that okay. No, I just want folks to, um, you know, I, I believe in what um, Jago Boston's doing, um, and, and, and part of our mission is establishing relationships with members of the community. Um, you know, building those lines, uh, uh, those lines, of, building on those lines of communication and dialogue. Um, and so, I encourage anybody here, and you know, to pass on, have folks go on our website, LatinoLawEnforcementGroup.org. Go find us on Facebook, Jago Boston. Twitter, Instagram. I'm not the tech savvy guy, so I really can't tell you all the social media we have. Uh, we have a person that handles that stuff. But there we announce all the volunteer opportunities that we have. Uh, Monday, we have a huge opportunity. Goya's donating tons of products, uh, food products. Um, and I know that there's a little political uh, beef with, with Goya, um, but they're offering all these foods. And so Monday, between 8 and 12, we're spreading that food out to send it out to members of the community, right? So we wanna make sure that folks have access to this food for folks that may be, uh, you know, lacking food, access to food. Um, so that's one of those volunteer opportunities. Um, we got, you know, we have a big event every year, a gala event uh, to celebrate, you know, our culture um, in various ways. And so just go on our website and that's how you can get information about all the programs that we have, the civil service prep, the pre-academy, uh, the, the physical fitness workouts that we have. Members of our community are poorly uh, physically fit. And so we have these free physical fitness meetups. We just put a schedule out Monday, Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Uh, all that information is on our website. So it's a shameful plug on our website, but I'm doing it anyway. So I encourage folks to go on there and find out what we do and then find out how you can contribute uh, with your time. Thank you, thank you. Any, um, and I, I want to, uh, any, te veo que um, tiene tu mano levantada, te quiero reconocer. Um, and before I do, llegó, llegó in Spanish means arrived. So I don't know if y'all know that, but llegó has arrived, y'all, just in case you didn't know. Mm -hmm. Dale, Annie. Yeah, eh, tengo que retirarme en unos minutos porque estoy haciendo algo importante que tengo que presentar ahorita a las cinco, pero eh, creo que lo siento cuando me llamaron, creo que en ese momento me levanté, no lo escuché, pero a mí me gustaría ver también si la policía, no sé si es parte del proceso de ellos, que voy a hablar desde un desconocimiento, eh, que 
quizá deberían hacer más actividades culturales y cómo involucran la comunidad para ir viendo cómo respondemos como comunidad. Y también si en algún momento pueden llegar actividades que hagan las organizaciones o la comunidad para ver cómo respondemos también nosotros, ¿verdad? Y ver si se nos quita ese miedo eh, a interactuar con ustedes como policía y comunidad. Y la otra cosa es que me hubiese gustado también que la traducción hubiese sido simultánea, así como es al inglés, no sé qué el problema que tuvieron. Igual entiendo que hay problemas a veces de tecnología, ¿verdad? Y a veces eso interrumpe como la secuencia de lo que uno quiere decir y de repente no dice todo. Y lo último que yo quisiera mencionar es que no se nos olvide, quizás no van a traducir todo lo que voy a decir, pero que no podemos cerrar los ojos a un sistema quebrado que no está respondiendo a la gran mayoría. Yo lo siento mucho por los que quizás no están a favor de nosotros. No estoy diciendo que la policía no hace nada o que los concejales no hacen nada, simplemente que es una realidad y que no podemos agachar la cabeza y decir que todo está bien, que el problema solamente es de educación o que el problema solamente es por un idioma, sino que hay un sistema quebrado que no nos favorece y eso lamentablemente no podemos eh, dejar de decirlo. No estamos diciendo que solo es responsabilidad de la policía, que solo es responsabilidad de la comunidad o que solo es responsabilidad de los políticos o del sistema. Simplemente que hay un sistema quebrado que hay que revisarlo, que no responde a las grandes mayorías, que somos nosotros, aunque nos llaman las minorías, pero para nosotros somos las grandes mayorías porque ya sabemos que las minorías quiénes somos, ¿verdad? O quiénes son, perdón, porque yo no soy dentro de, la grande, de las minorías, soy de las grandes mayorías. Entonces solamente eso quería decir. Agradezco la oportunidad y muchas gracias y espero que sigamos, podemos conectarnos. Nosotros tenemos diferentes actividades culturales. Ahora mismo estamos haciendo la campaña cívica. Andamos tocando puertas por todo East Boston. Vamos a extendernos un poco a Charleston que donde Charleston hay otro sistema ahí, que si lo comienzo a hablar no vamos a terminar ahora, pero son realidades de un poco diferentes a las de Isposta. Así que muy agradecida y con mucho respeto me despido y, y nos vemos muy pronto. Gracias, Eni. Sí, te llamé a, anterior, pero ya tú eh, contestaste la pregunta que yo te hice a ti específicamente sobre qué es lo que podemos hacer diferentes o gracias por regresar y dejarnos saber. Eh, um, Erika o Graviela, um, ¿quiere traducir, por favor? Y tomé el, el punto que dijiste que tenía que también traducir en, en español lo que estaban hablando en inglés. Yo pensé que había esa interpretación pasando. Um, Graviela. Ok, um, ¿es there algo? Um, yeah, sorry, I have to go. I have an important meeting that I have to present at 5 p.m. Um, I know you called me and uh, I think I stepped out for a little bit. So, um, so with respect to police um, awareness um, to, to do cultural community events, um, to see um, how the community can respond. Also, as, um, community, as a community organization, we do events and maybe you can come to our events and perhaps we can start loosen the fear and start interacting with the police as a community. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to mention is to provide simultaneous interpretation. And I know perhaps we had some technical issues there. And I know that when we do consecutive interpretation, we do it by sequence. Sometimes you lose the trend of thoughts when you have to pause and stop. Um, and lastly, let's not forget this. We can't just um, keep our eyes closed um, in front of this broken system. I know that this broken system is not in our favor. Um, I'm not saying that um, the the police is responsible, just the police is responsible or the counselors, but I'm just um, naming the reality here. And also, it's not, it's not just an issue of education or language, uh, but that the system is broken and it's not in our favor and that not only the community responsible or pol politicians or anything but i know that the system only um is, is in favor of the minority 
which I don't belong to the minority that, that benefits from this because I am part of a majority, which is community, even though they call us minority. Um, so thank you again for the opportunity. Um, yes, as a matter of fact, we're doing some cultural events now. We're doing a, com a civic campaign. We are uh, door knocking on East Boston. We're also going to do it in Charlestown, which is another system that I don't want to start talking about it, which is different from East Boston. So grateful for the space and so much respect, and I have to leave. Gracias, gracias. Okay, so um, Director Wong, I just wanted to, you know, there's, I think there's such an amazing opportunity, um, not just to be the, intra the, the interpreter, but to really help support um, these conversations that just live outside of just the, the technical aspect of translation and interpretation. So I'm just curious about what you've heard and kind of where do you see yourself kind of plugging in? Thank you so much, Councillor. I think one of the uh, perhaps partnerships that we can do um, with um, city council offices is as we, this budget cycle, we did get funding for grants that would go directly to community-based organizations who do host um, events or want to increase their language access um, uh, services. So perhaps that is also another medium for getting funding to these community-based organizations who are doing such important work so that they can also um, ensure that the people that they're serving are getting the services. I know that during the pandemic, there was a lot of community orgs who were helping various communities, but they didn't have the language capacity to support everybody. Um, and so I think those grants will be um, helpful in that space as well. Thank you for that. Thank you. So I am not one to hold people hostage for the sake of holding you hostage. Um, I also just wanted to make note for the record that the reason why I haven't called on my colleagues is because um, they're not here, not because I didn't want to give them the space. Just want to note that for the record too. Um, and I wanted to just uh, thank, I wanted to see if there's any public testimony, Shane, before we start uh, closing out. Hi, Councilor. Yeah, we got to everybody. We don't have any more. Uh, public testimony. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to just end in gratitude and really thanking the uh, the panelists, our our administration, the community activists, um, and everyone. Because like I said in the beginning, it's going to take all of us to get to where we need to be, and this is where it starts. It's by having honest conversation and really seeing us, seeing ourselves um, in this, um, and really seeing people for who they are and what they hope to do, and how we can all build together. So really looking forward to um, keeping this in committee and more importantly, coming out with something that's really concrete. And it sounds like Superintendent Chin, alongside the administration, that there is an opportunity and an appetite to work in deeper partnership with community around um, hosting some native language uh, programming. So I want to hold myself accountable to that. And then on the policy perspective, I am going to be looking at and trying to dive deeper into the numbers of the Latino officers um, who make up the force. Because one thing is to bring us in and the other is to keep us. And I think that there's some discrepancies there and that I think that we have an opportunity to kind of dive a little bit deeper into the data um, when, we're, when we're thinking about representation. I'm not sure if uh, Director Everett or Superintendent Chin, you would know this, but I'm curious to know how many um, per neighborhood, what the racial um, demographic background looks like in our police department. And I'm wondering if any of you know that. Um, so I just have some numbers here. Um, I don't know where they're all assigned, but there's 209 Hispanic male officers and 44 Hispanic female officers that are in our data bank. So uh, that is roughly 253 officers of Hispanic descent. Um, so that's that's what I have here. And then for civilians, um, there are 70 Hispanic male and 77 uh, Hispanic female. So uh, I don't know where they're all assigned offhand, but you know we have we do have some diversity, and maybe um, Officer Marrero might know a little bit more. 
Yeah, I, I, I think I think that that's something that I want to note for the record um, for the administration, because I know they do listen in at some point of, to these hearings, is that I, I'm interested in that data of, of where they where they actually are. Um, and I'm also interested in knowing how many of our Latino law enforcement members are in positions of power, like leadership position, um, whether they're captains or super, you know, like superintendents, like, do we have data on that? Um, yeah, so we do have on the command staff, we have um, two uh, male, uh, Latino males who are on the command staff, and that two. is um, two. Louis Cruz and Felipe Colon. Two? Yes, on the command staff currently, who are deputies or superintendents. Out of 200 and how many? Yes. yes. Is, is that is that on par with the norm? Is that well? There's that there's 21 command staff members, so they make up two of the 21, and um, that's just at the highest level. I'm saying at the highest level, and then you know if you go down, there's 21 sergeants, you know, 19 detectives, um, males, and then three. Um, Hispanic females and six uh, six Hispanic female detectives. So, I mean, that's what we have for data. Um, and we can we can we can get more information to you if you need it. Um, you know, for you know, we're gonna try to figure out where they're all assigned for you. You know, I don't have that information right now. Yeah, I I think it's important for us to have some benchmarks, right, to understand where we are and where we want to be, and then thinking about the action plan on how to get there. So Izzy, I'm just curious about, I know that you do more programming, but from a policy perspective, you know, our office has been working closely with Mamlio around some of these issues. So I'm just curious, you know, as the, you know, the Latino law enforcement arm of this, where, where, where should we be? I mean, we should be reflective of what the neighborhood reflects, right? I mean, we got, and the, these folks are, dictating policies. I will say this, kudos to the current commissioner. Um, I don't think there's ever been a time in almost the 22 years that I've been on the job that the command staff, deputy superintendent and above, has been so diverse. Uh, so, you know, would I like to see more Latino representation? Absolutely. However, I, I can't overlook the fact that it's, it's quite diverse. Uh, and there's, I believe, more females in the command staff than there's ever been again, in my 20 years on the job, 20 plus years. So uh, kudos to the commissioner uh, being mindful of that. Um, could we do better? We can always, right? Every every single demographic can say, hey, we want more, we want more, we want more, right? And the reality is, is how do we put those folks in those positions, right? They gotta have the resume, right? But also it's the opportunity for promotion. You can't make a deputy or superintendent unless you make the ranks of sergeant, unless you know, or above. Uh, and I think our numbers, aren't very reflective, right? What We got to have more officers taking those exams and we got to have more officers scoring high enough to where we're now getting promoted. And when those opportunities present themselves to promote those officers, we got to take advantage of that. Thank you, thank you for that. So I um, did promise that I was not gonna hold anyone hostage. So I just wanted to make sure um, if anyone has any closing remarks, um, I just want to thank everyone again for being T spending time with us and, and being your full selves here, right? Because um, sometimes I think when people come to hearings, they never know what they're going to get. Um, so I really do appreciate the vulnerability and the honesty that you all have brought into the space. So thank you so very much for um, joining us uh, today. Um, and I'm going to keep Hello? this. Yes. No, oh, sorry. Mom. Okay. I'm like, oh my God, somebody else, I, I did not let speak. Um, so with that, um, Stephanie, I'm not sure if this is going to be one of your last hearings with me. I, I, I believe so. I just want to say thank you for your leadership. Um, OPAD has just been such a beautiful thing to see grow under your leadership. And just so thank you um, so very much for everything. I cannot wait to see what you're going to be doing um, when you head over to uh, clean up the house over there and get things in order. Um, Thank you for your leadership. Really do appreciate you and all that you have done for the city. Um, thank you, Superintendent Chin. Thank you, Director Wong. Um, thank you to the um, members of the community um, for being here with us in our public testimony. Um, and, and more importantly, thank you to Central staff. Um, 
gracias por todo. I am going to gavel us out. Um, this hearing is adjourned and I will keep it in committee. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.